Apologies for the technical delay. So our next speaker is Keenan, and he'll be talking about uh, GIF, which is an MPC software library. Yeah. Hi, everybody. I'm, I'm Keenan. I'm a PhD student here at BU, and I'm also a software engineering fellow at SAIL, Software Application Innovation Lab. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about GIF, which is a JavaScript MPC framework. This is GIF with a double F, not to be confused with the previous GIF from the previous talk. We also have battleships, and I'm going to talk about that perhaps. So don't, don't be confused by that. OK, um, so this is a bit of a different kind of talk than the previous ones in the sense that uh, this is a framework that is working at a different uh, level. This is not as high level as something like Conclave, where you just type in SQL queries and it compiles everything for you. This is really at the programming language level. right? And in fact, uh, some of the people working on Conclave, Ben is trying to actually implement using Jiffa backend for Conclave. So this, this is a much lower level. And I'll show you examples very soon. But before I start, let me just uh, begin by acknowledging all these wonderful people that have uh, we've all worked together on implementing GIF at various levels. Lots of people wrote a lot of code. It's a very big project. And also people have used it. People have given us feedback about how to improve it and all that, on that, all that stuff. All right. So why GIF? From what I described to you, it's like a, it's like a low level kind of MPC framework and, and, and compared to these other ones. Don't we already have enough of those? And indeed, we have like already plenty of, of MPC frameworks. Um, the thing is, GIF, the reason we designed it, the reason we want it is that we really wanted to emphasize certain, um, certain aspects that we feel are being overlooked by a lot of these frameworks. Uh, these aspects, these, these things uh, are particularly informed by previous uh, deployment that we've, that we've already done in the past um, using MPC. So um, I'll give you, I'll actually give you a more concrete example, but let me just talk about the deployments first. So uh, MBU since 2015, we've been doing this every year now. We've had a deployment with Boston Women Workforce Council where we're using MPC to analyze uh, pay data, um, salary data, um, different, 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 different types of salary data, sort of grouped by, by gender, by race, and by, by other factors. And the purpose of this study is basically studying the uh, wage gap between genders, between races. And the thing is, when we started doing this back in 2015, the MPC frameworks that were available, were, uh, available at the time really didn't cut it for us. We couldn't have just used one of them out of the box to, to implement these, these uh, an application like this one, particularly because, like it says up there, there's 114 companies that want to that wanna participate. None of them, absolutely zero of them, can actually install a sophisticated MPC framework or um, manage any of that stuff. The, the analysts running the study don't know anything about MPC. They, they're, not, they're not sophisticated enough to sort of manage a big cluster of machines and run stuff on it. So we had to do a solution where it's fully web-based, where Parties submitting their data can just open their browser, no installation, nothing is required. They just see a very friendly interface, insert their data, and that's it. That's done. Same on the analyst side. So because of this web, web component, because of how this is structured, we needed, an interf uh, we needed a framework that can actually support this and can integrate well with the technologies that we currently have in, in the web domain. So let me give you a bit more about, um, about, about, about those insights that, I've, uh, that I'm saying uh, we've acquired from these deployments. We really have three axes uh, um, uh, through which we want GIF, we wanted, uh, we wanted GIF, uh, design GIF by. There's protocol design, there's the web and mobile stack that I already mentioned, and there's software engineering maturity. On the protocol design, the thing to keep in mind, especially when thinking about deployments like that, is that you really, have a, a, you really want to support a sort of a flexible landscape. The different clients, the different parties in your system and your MPC uh, and your PC system have totally different capabilities, whether in terms of computation or in terms of availability, in terms of network bandwidth, in terms of resources, but also they have inherently different trust assumptions. Every party in the system or every group of parties will care about protecting different aspects of the data, care about different in integrity and confiden confidentiality guarantees, and we want our programs to reflect that, we want our systems to reflect that. And in fact, we want to use that, we want to utilize that to get better efficiency. And I'll talk a bit more about that later. And this goes into that asymmetries uh, bullet point that I have, I have there as well. Uh, when it comes to web and mobile stack, what we really want is we want our, uh, our MPC applications to hook up pretty nicely to existing web applications, to existing mobile applications, because chances are what you want to use MPC for is a small sort of, it's, it's the smallest, just like in Kotlin, the same philosophy, it's like the smallest piece of the system that really needs to have these strong guarantees. For a majority of your system, you don't want to rely on MPC because of a variety of reasons, and you just want to rely on the existing infrastructure that we currently know of, web and mobile apps, right? So that's there. 
Um, and also uh, another constraint that, that sort of is enforced because of this is that what we have to, everything that we have to build has to be in a language that can run on phones and run on browsers. That's why it's JavaScript. Not because we like the language, it's actually pretty bad, but just because we had to. All right, and finally is the software engineering maturity um, um, aspect of this. You really want the framework that you feel comfortable can, uh, can run at large scales, can support many, many parties, can support settings where parties come, in, come into the computation and leave the computation dynamically at any given point of time, where parties don't have to be the identities of the parties or even the count of the parties doesn't have to be set ahead of time. It can all be dynamic where communication is asynchronous. It's not synchronous. You might have packet loss, network, network partitioning, you might have crashes. You want to recover from all that. So this sort of distributed systems engineering aspect, we wanted to emphasize a lot in our, in our framework. So what is GIF? Now that I've given you a lot of motivation. Um, GIF is basically a general purpose MPC framework. It, um, in its current form right now, it just supports, it just considers a semi-honest um, um, sort of parties. So we don't have malicious uh, parties yet. Maybe in the future we're planning on supporting that. But so we, we assume that all the parties in our system are incentivized. They're going to follow the protocol. They're not going to deviate from the protocol, but they are curious. They want to learn some information if they can. And by default, we, so we, we support, we, um, we um, protect um, confidentiality against coalitions of up to n minus one parties. So even if you only have one honest party in your system, you're fine. That honest party's input is uh, guaranteed to be safe, it's guaranteed to be private. We can use GIF in the pre-processing model in order to speed things up, but we don't have to. It's a, it's a function that we have. And it also ships with a, a, a bunch of uh, predefined primitives, protocols, functions for achieving different levels. The main important thing about GIF is that you can really customize it. So all of these assumptions that I've described, if they don't apply to, to, the, to, your, uh, to your use case, if some of them only apply but the others don't, you can just literally override every single line of code in GIF if you want to and just, you know, implement, uh, implement the, the, re-implement the components that you need in the way that you, that you want them so that they satisfy your assumptions. Clearly, if you're going to re-implement everything, then it's of no use. But likely, what you're going to have to re-implement is just a small part here or there. And I'm going to show you examples again. So here's our architecture. As opposed to a lot of the other MPC frameworks, what we're working on is a ser server centralized model where you have a server in the middle surrounded by the parties. Right? This server is just a logistics server. The reason we have it there is because, and fr from our experiences, lots of the times where you want to deploy MPC, the clients that you have, the parties that you have, don't really have public IPs, don't have reliable internet connections. They're going to come and go. They're going to leave. Network's going to fail. So you want, a server, you want to put a server in the middle that can sort of route the packets, route the messages between the different parties. From a crypto point of view, from a, a, a trust assumptions point of view, the server is totally meaningless unless you chose not to make it meaningless. It's meaningless because we're going to use public key crypto so that all the traffic that goes through the server actually is encrypted and the server can't really understand what's going on. The server here is just to facilitate the communication, facilitate the computation. That's it. So this server, obviously some of what, I, what I've described would break if the server is malicious. The server can stop servicing, uh, providing the service, can stop routing messages, and then your integrity fails. But we're assuming, uh, we're assuming the server, just like the other parties, are semi-honest. So that's all right for our case. Maybe in the future, we can do something different. Um, and again, the server's main functionality is sort of routing these messages between the different parties. Right? It doesn't only do that, because the server also keeps sort of mailboxes for the different parties in case a message comes and the party isn't connected, or in case some crash happens. So we also utilize the server for that. Um, other than that, you can assign, if you want to, when you're writing your code, you can assign any sort of logistical functionality that you need to the server so that the server can perform it. For example, if you want to announce parties that join the, that join the computation dynamically, the server can do that. If you want to authenticate based on sort of tokens or username, password stuff, uh, style stuff, you can do that also with, with the server. You can do a bunch of other things. And the server can also act as a party in case the server has inputs or wants to see the output or in case the server actually is going to participate in the code one way or the other, you can do that as well. By default, if you're not using pre-processing, the server will act as a crypto provider. That's a lot like how speeds used to be, how scale Mamba is. Um, so for example, you want Beaver triplet, uh, triples because you want to speed multiplications up, you can just ask the server to give you Beaver triples. That's fine. So let me show you some examples. The code that you're going to end up writing in GIF is going to be very similar to the code you would write in SIMD, a single instruction multiple data set paradigm. 
So that's an example right there that's just summing a bunch of numbers up and, and then opening the result. Open here also is the same as declassify if you're more familiar with declassify. So it's pretty straightforward to write. The nice thing about it is that it's also pretty straightforward to deploy because of some of the other features that I'll talk about later. This is the sum, this is a very simple example. Here's a bit of a more complicated example with binary search. It looks like JavaScript code. It is really JavaScript code. It's going to run in the browser. It's going to run. It can run on Node.js. It can run on mobile phone. It's totally fine. The only thing that the only reason it's a bit different is because instead of adding things up and instead of using if else, you're using the primitives that GIF provides, like that dot if underscore else, which is like an oblivious if statement. That's the only difference. Unfortunately, JavaScript doesn't support operator overloading. Otherwise, it would have been it would have looked exactly the same as as regular code. All right. So that's a lot of uh, motivation and sort of um, stuff to throw at you. Why, is, why, why should you care? What can you do with these things? What can you do with GIF? So we've already deployed GIF in practice. This happened, um, this, this deployment term in, uh, finished about a week ago, right, Frederick, a week? Yeah, about a week ago. Um, this is a paste setters deployment. So this is very similar to the deployment I described initially. It's also working on analyzing uh, um, uh, salary data, uh, not salary data actually. In this case, it's uh, spent dollar amount spent by, by companies in the Boston area and nationally. Uh, we had 18 input providers, 18 companies participate in this study. They're just input providers. They secret share their data into the two compute parties that we have. The compute parties that we have, one of them is a serve, is, is that server that I described, we chose to make it a compute party. That is run by BU, that's always available. And the other compute party is the analyst that is interested in, uh, uh, that is interested in seeing the result. That analyst isn't available throughout the computation, it just initiates it leaves, the computation, uh, the submission of input takes place over a period of about two weeks. And then at the end, that analyst joins the computation again, and only then is the aggregate finally computed. Um, we basically, in this deployment, we compute a bunch of averages, standard deviations, some usability metrics, all under MPC so that they're private. But we also provide the, uh, the users the ability to resubmit their data in case their data, they submitted it wrong the first time or something. That. So they, they can resubmit as much as they want. And we're not just computing averages and standard deviation over the, inter, the entire input set. We also have, uh, we, we, split the, we split the parties into two cohorts because we're doing a longitudinal analysis. So the first cohort is parties that have already participated in previous iterations of the study. The second cohorts are new parties. We compute the averages and the deviations for each cohort as well as the, uh, the, global, um, the global distribution, the entire input. And yeah, the, the collective amount spent that we analyzed exceeds 100 billion. So this is, uh, this is this, these are big companies. This is not something small. We also implemented a whole bunch of applications, mostly as um, web applications. As you can see, most of them are in the browser, but they can also run on phones. We have things like secure voting. We have a bunch of graph algorithms. We have routing there, which you will hear a lot more about tomorrow when Rowan's doing um, the routing talk. We have a bunch of other things too. But they all they all run in the web. They're reasonably fast, and they're most importantly very easy to develop and deploy and, and, and maintain. So what I'm going to talk about in the next three slides are sort of the MPC modules, the, MP, the models, the MPC settings, particularly in terms of, of the layout, the roles of the parties that we've used in these different applications and deployments. And I'm going to start with one that is more intuitive, one that is very popular these days the outsourced model, or at least what we call the outsourced model. Different people have different names. So what is the outsourced model? You have a limited number, few compute parties. These are parties that perhaps are always available. Somebody's phone is, whatever, okay. somebody forgot their phone there. Oh yeah, okay, cool, okay. All right, so yeah, so the outsourced model, uh, model is where you have a few number of compute parties that are always available that are doing the MPCs. Uh, but a very large number of input parties. The input parties aren't really participating in the computation. They're just secret sharing their inputs into those compute parties. This is very popular. Recently, ShareMind supports this. Now they have this web API, uh, web API um, thing that they support it. So it's, it's, it's getting very popular. And we've used this a lot. We use, we've used this in the pace setter deployment that I've just described. We're also using this in a collaboration that's ongoing with the ASTAR Institute in Singapore. We use, it, we use it in different places. And just to give you an idea of the scale that we've used, Jeff, and this model at, uh, in one of the larger, uh, larger uh, examples that we have, one of the larger applications, we have something like 640,000 shares shared between those parties when we do the computation. 
Another example here is the parallel MPC setting, which is um, perhaps a bit similar, and you can combine this with the, with the outsourced model. This is something that is very intuitive, something that's very useful to speed MPC up, but I haven't seen a lot of it, uh, surprisingly, perhaps. Here, every compute party, instead of having just one machine, has a bunch of machines. Think of every compute party as having a, a big cluster at its disposal, or perhaps a machine with many threads. And what you want to do is you want to leverage that to sort of shard your data horizontally so that the MPC is faster. So imagine you want to search for a word in a big corpus of text. That's like the canonical example. Or perhaps you want to do matrix multiplication. You can shard it. You can So think of matrix multiplication. You can split the computation up so that different servers do independent portions of that computation, compute different portions of the output matrix in parallel so that effectively you have a speed up. Right? The trick here is you have to be sure that in every the way you split this computation, you always have one party coming, one machine coming from every party. Otherwise, you're going to have a problem with your security guarantees, right? So we do that. We've, we've used that also a lot in different in different uh, applications. Um, just yesterday, we were running some benchmarks actually on this uh, in, in this in this setting on preference matching. That's the first application here. You have sort of a big matrix that represents preferences of users. Um, in the benchmarks, we had something like uh, 10,000 users. And the preferences could be something like, I smoke, I don't smoke, I want to be matched with somebody who smokes or doesn't smoke, or I want to be matched with somebody that likes this kind of music, something like that. And the secure computation that we have is basically generating this big matrix that encodes all these, all these preferences, how well, how well one person matches to the other. And we can do this fairly quickly. The, the, the benchmarks we were running yesterday had something like 100 million secure multiplications and about half a billion uh, secure additions with uh, 32 machines per party. So that's the size of the cluster. The nice thing about this is that it's scale, the scale here is perfect. You have linear scaling that is uh, absolutely perfect in the sense that if you double the number of machines per party, you get your runtime drops by two. Spreading the computation? So yeah, that's, that's a good question. Unfortunately, in this work, we're not really focused on sort of automatic compilation or sort of guessing how we can automatically optimize the stuff. It's a lot more manual than that. But I will say that, at least in my experiences, it is kind of friendly. Like it's not very hard, because GIF is designed with this in mind, right? It's very friendly to express this and deploy it and manage it without too much hassle. But it is manual. It's not automatic. All right. So here's a third, uh, a third way you can structure your MPC, a hierarchical MPC. This is uh, a bit different than the previous two. Um, this is particularly useful in cases where you want to you wanna run MPC in, a, in, a, in an environment where you already have a hierarchy between the parties. So the, the example that we have here is this uh, private accountability for the US court system study that was carried on by some researchers from MIT. They used GIF in, in their study. And the reason it made sense for them is because the court system is structured hierarchically, right? You have several levels of courts, right? Going from like state level to federal level to various, various level within that. And the way, the way the, the, one way you could possibly structure your analysis in this case is you can have every sort of group, every, every, every group of neighboring parties perform part of the computation, part of the MPC on their own data, get an aggregate that represents their inputs, right? And move that aggregate up in the hierarchy, right? And this all happens under MPCs. So you're not leaking information at any given point, but it makes every MPC smaller because it involves less parties and involves less inputs. This is very, very useful if the kind of analysis you're running is sort of quadratic in the number of inputs. Because at every time, or maybe, or more than quadratic, right? As long as it's not linear. Because every time you get a bunch of inputs, you compute the aggregate. The aggregate is very small. The actual computation is quadratic or more. So you actually get, you get the benefit of that, right? So that's very nice. And we've actually tried this at, at the scale of 100 compute parties, sort of structured in this, in this, in this hierarchical form. And it works pretty fine. Um, the last setting I'm going to describe, which is a lot more abstract than the previous ones, is sort of full asymmetric MPC. Yeah, sorry. You had a question? This one? Okay. Um, so this is the last setting. It's, uh, it's more abstract than the previous one. This is the full asymmetric MPC. You can imagine a setting where every party has radically different capabilities, radically different resources. And the way you would structure your, your computation is you would split it into parts where each part is carried by a different, perhaps overlapping set of parties. Some of these parts could be executing at the same time. Some of them could be in, uh, in sequence. It's a lot more abstract, but you'll hear a lot more about it to, in tomorrow's talk that Rowan's giving on, on route recommendation, which, which uh, is a lot like that. 
Using these settings, um, using GIF, we've built several applications. These are just like demos for our own purposes. They haven't been deployed, but they span a, a, a large set of, of different applications that you might want to use MPC for. We have things like data structures, uh, different kind of sorting, different kind of um, searching, binary search, which is non-trivial to do under MPC, if you think about it. We also, have, uh, we also have a bunch of graph algorithms. We have a bunch of statistics and AI style stuff like PCA and linear regression and other things. And we also have SQL-like relations where you sort of do filtering, you do joins, group by aggregation of different sorts. And then we also have battleships, just like the previous GIF uh, talk. All right. So what are the components of GIF from a software engineer perspective? GIF is split uh, into four main components. We have the core API, which is basically the primitives that I've described, things like addition, multiplication, division, comparisons, all these kind of stuff, oblivious if conditions, stuff like that. Also, you have the secret sharing library, which is by default Shamir secret sharing, but you can always replace it with anything you want. You can do additive secret sharing, anything else. We have a logistics component that handles a lot of the key management aspects, that handles a lot of async the asynchronicity and dynam dynamicity aspects where parties can come and can go, um, uh, and also to handle things like network failures and crashes and stuff like that. We also have the hooks API and we have extensions. These are kind of related. Um, hooks is just as a, a fancy word for like a software engineering technique that allows you to inject your code into GIF, even if you're not really even if you're just using GIF, you're not really developing it. And we use hooks for, for a variety of reasons. In particular, you can use hooks, uh, hooks, uh, hooks in GIF to specialize any sort of functionality that you want inside GIF. But you can also use it to hook GIF to existing, um, to existing workflows, to existing applications, kind of like that paste setter deployment, because you have this very large application that handles a lot of like the database management, uh, authentication of users, emailing users, is giving them URLs, stuff like that. Um, a, a complicated UI that is friendly to use. You can hook Drift pre uh, pretty nicely up to stuff like that using the hooks. The extensions are sort of things that we built that you can put on top of Drift just to give you some extra functionality. Um, a lot of them is, are implemented using these hooks, but they could be implemented in different ways. Um, so we have a lot of primitives. I'm not going to really spend a lot of time on this, but um, the nice thing is that you can always define your own primitives. You can always customize the primitives that we provide you in case you don't like them. Lots of our primitives support, uh, run in the pre-processing model, and we give you a lot of options as to the pre-processing protocols that you can run and how you can structure your computation. And when you do the pre-processing, whether you want to do the pre-processing sort of continuously or in a stage before that, and then run your computation, you have different options to do different things. We have uh, three extensions right now, one for sort of supporting uh, big numbers because JavaScript is notorious with, with big numbers. Any number that is above like 60 bit is really unsafe to use in, in JavaScript. You'll, you'll get errors even if you're just adding numbers together, which is very silly. Uh, we also support negative numbers. We support fixed point arithmetic. These are extensions that you can use. They're all available online. Uh, finally, for future work, for GIF particularly, we have two things that we're currently looking at. One of them is supporting having several logistics server instead of one, just so that you can you can scale horizontally in a better way, but also doing away with that in case you want to and just falling back to peer-to-peer -to -peer communication if that makes sense to your application. We also are interested in developing static analysis tools that can help you analyze the performance, analyze and predict the performance of sort of GIF programs so you have a better sense of the different trade-offs that you have. Um, this could help you a lot choose the appropriate primitives for your protocol. You have a lot of dimensions usually with MPC applications, including things like number of parties, size of the input, the size of the field you're running in, all these different things. They, in, they interact in a in very interesting and non-trivial way, and we want to help you, we want to help developers visualize that and sort of make decisions based on that. And finally, really the, the, the long-term vision for this kind of work is to bring MPC to the masses, uh, to the masses. And that's really, that involves a lot of work. The particular thing we're interested in is for, uh, sort of developing a large collection of tools that sort of help you analyze, help you automatically compile, automatically deploy, automatically manage all these MPC applications that you want. This spans from something really high level like Conclave to something very low level like GIF or even lower than that. Um, that's it. Thank you very much for listening. And all of GIF, the demos, all of this code is all available publicly at that address on GitHub. Feel free to look at it and use it if, if, uh, if you're curious. Right.